It's been more than 19 months since Boeing's, we'll say, less than stellar, first uncrewed orbital flight test of the company's CST-100 Starliner in December 2019. Now Boeing and NASA are ready to fly Starliner's second uncrewed test flight, called Orbital Flight Test 2, or OFT-2, to show the spacecraft is ready to fly people aboard it later this year or in early 2022. In this video, I'll go over the Starliner spacecraft, its commercial crew program development history, as well as its importance as a competitor of sorts with SpaceX and its Crew Dragon spacecraft. But first, I want to welcome all of my new subscribers and thank everybody for engaging in comments. I really do appreciate it. If you want to join this community of human spaceflight enthusiasts outside of YouTube, consider joining our Discord server. And if you want to help me and my goal to bring you amazing human spaceflight content full-time, consider supporting me on Patreon. Depending on the level you pledge at, you could get access to exclusive graphics and contents as well as your name in future videos. Links are in the description below. If you can't support Orbital Velocity financially, no worries. All you need to do is watch and share this video and launch that like button into orbit. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss another video. Now let's talk about Starliner and NASA's second commercial crew program spacecraft. Boeing's CST-100 Starliner is the second of two spacecraft NASA selected to help develop as part of the agency's commercial crew program. As mentioned earlier, the other is SpaceX's Crew Dragon, which has successfully flown people to the International Space Station three times as of this video's publication. NASA's commercial crew program was started in 2011 as a way to spur the development of private human-rated spacecraft in order for the agency to purchase seats aboard them to send astronauts to the International Space Station. It was a paradigm shift from human spacecraft development of the past, where NASA contracts a company or multiple companies to build a vehicle to the agency's specifications. As such, the space agency essentially owned the spacecraft. Under the commercial crew program, NASA is more of a customer and has general specifications, but the company owns the spacecraft and can use it for non-NASA customers. NASA is still heavily involved in making sure the vehicles are safe for people and offering expertise for companies while they are working through all of their required milestones. In 2014, NASA selected Boeing's Starliner along with SpaceX's Crew Dragon to be developed under the Commercial Crew Transportation Capability Program. The company was awarded $4.2 billion, which would be given out in increments depending on the milestones completed. For comparison, SpaceX was awarded $2.6 billion. Starliner comprises two parts, a crew module and a service module. The crew module is a conical-shaped capsule with a diameter of 4.6 meters. Combined with the service module, the stack extends to 5 meters. Overall, the mass of the spacecraft is around 13,000 kilograms and has a habitable volume of about 11 cubic meters. It has a design life of about 60 hours in free flight and around 210 days docked to a space station. The crew module also has a docking port to allow it to link up with one of two international docking adapters on the ISS. Starliner could hold up to seven people. However, NASA is only expected to ever utilize a four or five person configuration for regular space station crew rotation missions. Boeing has said it is willing to sell the extra fifth seat to potential commercial and government-sponsored astronauts or even spaceflight participants. The crew module has a heat shield to protect it during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. Additionally, the capsule is equipped with parachutes and landing airbags to perform a soft touchdown on the land in the western United States after a nominal mission. Boeing says the Starliner crew module is designed to fly up to 10 times. As such, Boeing has only built three. Spacecraft 1 was used for a launch abort system test and is not expected to ever fly into space. Spacecraft 2 is assigned to fly the OFT-2 mission. Spacecraft 3 was the first to fly into space in December 2019 on the original OFT mission. After it landed in New Mexico, it was named Calypso. When Spacecraft 2 lands after the OFT-2 mission, it'll also get a name. Each spacecraft is paired with an expendable service module. It has 28 reaction control thrusters, 20 orbital maneuvering and attitude control thrusters, and four launch abort engines. The abort engines are located at the bottom of the service module and can propel the spacecraft away from its carrier rocket in the event of a launch failure. Also at the base of the service module are solar cells to power the vehicle during its cruise to the International Space Station. Starliner launches atop a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket in a special configuration called N22, which means it has no payload fairing, it sports two strap-on solid rocket motors, and has a Centaur upper stage with two RL-10A-42 engines. With the spacecraft perched atop, the rocket stands 52.4 meters tall. Starliner missions will launch from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, just south of NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. In the mid-2010s, United Launch Alliance built a tower and crew access arm for astronauts to get into Starliner while on the pad. 
a few seconds before liftoff, the Atlas V's RD-180 engine ignites, consuming liquid oxygen and rocket-grade kerosene in the rocket's common core booster. Once they are at full power, the two strap-on solid rocket motors fire and the vehicle is released. After a brief vertical ascent, the stack begins to pitch over toward the northeast to line itself up with the trajectory of the International Space Station. After about 90 seconds, the solid rocket motors burn out, but are held on for an additional 50 seconds before falling away. At 4 minutes 29 seconds, the Common Core booster engine shuts down. Six seconds later, the Centaur upper stage with its two RL-10 engines separate before igniting to consume liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen for thrust. The ascent cover or nose cone of the Starliner falls away about 4 minutes and 41 seconds into flight. During this final Atlas V burn, the aero skirt underneath Starliner, which extends the spacecraft's surface to enhance the aerodynamic stability of the vehicle during ascent, is jettisoned at about 5 minutes and 5 seconds after liftoff. Some 12 minutes after leaving Florida, the Centaur engines cut off and Starliner is separated to fly on its own. However, since the vehicle is in a very long suborbital trajectory, Starliner itself will need to fire its thrusters to push the spacecraft into a stable parking orbit before beginning its day-long trek to the ISS. When Boeing was selected by NASA in 2014 to be one of two companies to build spacecraft for the commercial crew program, it needed to perform a number of milestones along the way. However, three big milestones were required in order to prove the spacecraft was ready to fly people on regular space station crew rotation missions. A pad abort test, an uncrewed orbital flight test, and a crewed flight test. The first was a pad abort test. This was done on November 4, 2019 at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Spacecraft 1 was used. While all four abort engines ignited successfully and the crew module and service module separated cleanly, there was an issue with one of the three main parachutes on the way back down to the desert. One didn't deploy. Landing with only two of three parachutes is a contingency procedure for this spacecraft, and it is designed to survive a harder than normal landing. However, that wasn't being tested for this evaluation. Regardless, the airbag cushion helped with the harder than planned landing and NASA deemed that it would have been safe for astronauts. As such, the test was declared a success. It turned out that a pin meant to connect the pilot chute with the main chute was not properly connected. There is now a system in place to ensure this human-caused error doesn't happen again. With the pad abort test cleared, the next step was the orbital flight test. That was now set for December 20th, 2019. It was supposed to be a full end-to-end -end test of the entire Starliner mission from launch, rendezvous, docking, undocking, deorbit, and landing. Liftoff atop an Atlas V N22 rocket went exactly as planned. The vehicle was placed into a suborbital trajectory just shy of orbital velocity. Starliner's first job after separating was to use its own engines to finish the job of placing it into a parking orbit. But that didn't happen. Starliner struggled to put itself in a stable but incorrect orbit, which ultimately meant the docking with the International Space Station was out of the cards. The vehicle was deorbited two days later, landing in White Sands, New Mexico. It would later be found that an internal mission timer anomaly caused Starliner to perform a sequence of maneuvers at the incorrect time and miss its orbital insertion burn, according to Boeing. That required quick intervention from mission controllers on the ground to command the spacecraft into a lower but stable orbit. After evaluating options, NASA and Boeing agreed to forego the trip to the ISS and land early. Boeing stresses, however, that even though the spacecraft did not go to the ISS to demonstrate rendezvous and docking objectives, Starliner performed nominally or better than nominal performance during launch, orbital flight reentry, and landing operations. After an independent review team completed its analysis of the Starliner OFT mission, calling it a highly visible close call, it was decided that Boeing would need to complete some 60 or more corrective actions in the software of the spacecraft. It was also found that there was a second point in the mission that Starliner could have been lost. This software error was caught and fixed only a few hours before the vehicle's return to Earth, but could have resulted in the service module's thrusters firing in the wrong manner after separation. After the investigation, Boeing said it would refly the OFT mission at no additional cost to NASA. This was an out-of-pocket cost to the company estimated to be roughly $410 million. Now, after more than a year and a half after the first orbital flight test, OFT-2 is finally ready to take to the skies to fully validate Starliner's systems. To make way for Starliner at the ISS, the Crew-2 Dragon spacecraft at the outpost had to move from the forward port of the Harmony module to the space-facing port of Harmony. OFT-2, like OFT-1, will be an end-to-end -end test of the whole mission to the International Space Station. It'll also carry with it more than 180 kilograms of cargo and crew supplies. It's also expected to return about 250 kilograms of equipment, including a reusable nitrogen-oxygen recharge system for refurbishment on the ground. Also aboard is an anthropometric test device called Rosie the Riveter. It was also aboard the OFT-1 mission and included a multitude of sensors. According to Boeing, because the company got all the data it needed on that device during the first flight, it doesn't have the sensors installed for the OFT-2 mission, and instead it's mostly used for ballast. 
During launch, data will be collected on the performance of the guidance, navigation, and control systems of both the Starliner spacecraft and the Atlas V launch vehicle. This also includes monitoring the acoustic and vibration levels and loads across the interior and exterior of the vehicle. After Starliner reaches space, it's expected to take a day to reach the ISS. According to NASA, during Starliner's approach to the outpost, the agency and Boeing are expected to verify data links and command capabilities by the ISS crew, which includes a commanded hold during approach by ISS commander and Japanese astronaut Aki Hoshide. An automated retreat capability during approach will also be tested. Starliner's rendezvous with the ISS will also validate the spacecraft's vision-based navigation system as it autonomously docks with the forward port of the Harmony module. One change to Starliner from the original OFT mission was the addition of a cover to protect the docking mechanism during re-entry, since the nose cone is jettisoned during ascent. After it reaches orbit, this cover is opened in much the same way SpaceX's Crew Dragon's nose cone deploys. Other OFT2 mission objectives include verifying in-orbit operations of the avionics, docking system, communications and telemetry systems, environmental control systems, solar arrays, and propulsion systems. Under the current plan, a Starliner is slated to stay docked for about five days before undocking and performing a deorbit burn to land in the western United States. Assuming all goes well with this mission and all milestones are completed successfully, NASA and Boeing will begin looking for launch opportunities to fly the first people aboard Starliner as early as later this year. The first piloted Starliner flight, called the Crew Flight Test, is expected to include NASA astronauts Barry Wilmar, Nicole Mann, and Mike Fink. Once the CFT mission occurs and its milestones are successfully completed, the first crew rotation flight, Starliner 1, can be put into the ISS visiting vehicle schedule. Boeing is contracted with NASA to fly six crew rotation missions. Combined with SpaceX's Crew Dragon, the United States' access to the ISS should be certain for the foreseeable future, with two different spacecraft flying atop two different rockets. If an issue occurs with any of those vehicles, NASA has an alternative way to access the outpost. Additionally, with the Soyuz flying Cosmos to the ISS, there will be three human-rated spacecraft able to send people to the outpost or any space station in low Earth orbit, setting the stage for a future after the International Space Station's life is over, likely around 2030. Are you excited to see Starliner fly again? And do you think its development problems are over? Let me know in the comments below. If I've earned it, it'd mean the world to me if you could subscribe to the channel and share this video with friends and family. And don't forget to launch that like button into orbit. And while you're at it, consider supporting Orbital Velocity on Patreon to help me and my goal to bring you amazing human spaceflight content full time. Depending on the level you pledge at, you could get access to exclusive graphics and content as well as your name in future videos. Finally, be sure to follow Orbital Velocity on Twitter and Facebook. You can also visit Orbital-Velocity for even more space-related content. Links are in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, at Astra.